for coming to the third um, of our physics cafe talks. Uh, this uh, um, talk is given by my colleague, Dr. Gianluca Memoli, from the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, just down the road. And uh, um, Gianluca is uh, quite famous as the bubble man of the MPL because um, his research is on bubbles, and in particular the sound of bubbles. So he will uh, um, entertain us, hopefully, I'm sure. No pressure. <laughs> I'm sure that he will. Uh, with bubbles, what we can do with them, and also how we can uh, sort of listen to them. Yes. Yes, something like that. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Elisabetta, for inviting me. You love to tell me whether my voice is too high, please. Is that okay? Great. Can you all hear me? That's a good start. Right. So, as Elisabetta was saying, um, I am a bubble scientist. Now, you might be familiar with the National Physical Laboratory, which is just down the road. I also live down the road. I'm very lazy in this. Uh, it's a place where there are uh, more than 600 scientists. Each of them is specialized in measuring one thing very, very precisely. So what I'm trying to convince you tonight, what I'm going to tell you about is, of course, bubbles and why are they so important for us? Why they affect our life? Why we couldn't do without studying them? Why we probably wouldn't have the comforts that we have nowadays without bubbles? That's a bit ambitious, you might say, but that's probably because uh, when I say I measure bubbles, what do you think? So what do you think? What do I do? Size. Okay, what else? Frequency. Frequency. Bubbles and frequency, what's that? How many bubbles you're actually producing a particular liquid? Okay. That's a good point. So, how many bubbles you produce in a single liquid? But what bubbles are we talking about? So, are we talking about these? Oh, oh yes. I have to tell you something at the start. This is an. Uh, is I'm an experimentalist. Experiments means in science that most of the times the thing you do don't work. So you should be prepared to that tonight. I tried to tune the, um, the recipe that I used to this size of the room, but soon the lights will warm everything up and so I will not be able to do as large bubbles as I would like to. So what I was saying is, are we talking about those or are we talking about something else. So when I say I measure bubble, what bubbles are you thinking about? Anyone? Bubbles in meringue. I cannot hear you. Bubbles in meringue. In meringue. Oh wow, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's a good point. Why do you want bubbles in meringue? That's a good point. It's the same that you want for bread, don't you? But you just want the right amount of bubbles there because you actually put the, uh, the yeast to make the bubble grow and you, at a certain point you increase the temperature and you stop the bubbles. So you just want the right amount of bubbles. True. Any other bubbles you can think of? Elizabeth, or anyone else? Okay, let's start from soap bubbles. Have you ever played with soap bubbles? Have you? Oh, that's a good start. Now, what do you actually need to make a soap bubble? Soap. Soap, that's a good point. What else? Water, Water yes. Air. Air, yes. Anything else? A former. A former, yes. That's a very good point. You need a shape. Let me call it that way. You need an object which has a shape which will eventually decide uh, how much you have to blow or how many bubbles you do, as you were saying before. So, bubbles technologies are then dependent on what you use to make them, on how you make them. But they're also dependent on what you put in your recipe to make the bubbles, or if you like, on where the bubbles are. And size, as in the example of the meringue or the bread, 
is one part, the number is another part. But that's just the beginning. That's just the start of what we can do with bubbles. So before I go into what I do in my everyday research, let me tell you about something that we normally perceive about bubbles. So first, you, you said we should start with a shape. But what do, what's the shape of a bubble? It's round, isn't it? Well, but it's also wobbly. The larger you get, the more difficult it is to maintain them in a spherical shape. And why is it that you have spherical bubbles? Why are they spherical and not, I don't know, cubic? Surface tension. Looks like I have an expert in the room tonight. So the story is surface tension is a word which we use to, uh, it's a name actually, that we give to a force which keeps the stuff in and keeps the rest of the world out. So in the case uh, of soap bubbles, we affect the surface tension by using uh, the water and the soap. But the strange stuff is that by adding soap, we don't increase the surface tension, which is a property of the liquid and the gas in itself. We decrease it. it soap bubbles are maintained together because there is a net of chemical bonds which keep the bubble together. If you have ever seen one of those big balloons that you used to actually, well, go in the sky, then uh, those are held by a net on the ground and then they are released eventually. So uh, the Montgolfier, well, Montgolfier brothers used the balloon like that to go into the sky before we had planes. And they used the net. And so what we do with soap is we create a net. And in fact, soap bubbles pop because eventually there are holes in the net. Because if you look at a very large bubble, you'll see that the water eventually goes down. And then there is a small drop and basically they became dry on top. Now, this means that, of course, if you, you can trick soap bubbles by wetting your hand and go inside it without breaking it. And again, that's something that is used, an experience that we get from soap bubbles that is used in many applications, which impact, for instance, on how we cure cancer nowadays and how we will cure it in the future. But let me talk about strong bubbles. Do you know what that one is? I know that there is a bit of light at the back, so we will try it. If it doesn't work, I'll tell you what you're seeing. Anyone, any idea? That's a pond skater. A pond skater is an insect that we say works on water. But actually, what happens is that if you, well, if there was a better contrast, you could see that actually under the legs of the pond skater, there is a small indentation, like the one that we have here, when we press on a balloon. And that is what is pushing the pond skater up. Or at least, that's what was thought until a few, well, decades ago, when they went to observe the leg of a pond skater with a microscope. And they found that the leg is made by small, small, tiny airs, and on those sit smaller and smaller tiny bubbles. And are those which propel the pond skater up. So actually, the pond skater is not working on water, it's working on bubbles. Now, it's not the only animal which does that. There is another one which comes with the name of the uh, Jesus Christ lizard. And I don't know what you can see on the movie, but in the movie you see a snake which is threatening our lizard, which decides to run on water, going very quickly. And he uses the same trick of the pond skater, but it's something that he couldn't do without creating bubbles under its feet. Now, this has been tried by humans without a great success, I must say. So if you go, if you Google uh, and look for uh, people walking on water, you see a lot of movies like that. Most of them are tricks. Most of them actually show a person which eventually falls in the water. 
which means that probably you need to control the strength of bubbles better if you want to do that. Uh, the only movie which will show you um, some sort of success um, as, as a star uh, illusionist magic dynamo who actually walked in central London along the river. Uh, he also was using bubbles, only in, the, in his case they were plastic ones and held by someone under the water. So if you control the bubbles, then you can do something which you wouldn't expect before. Now, we were talking about the shape, and we were talking about the size of bubbles. Now, I measure bubbles in food, I measure bubbles in medical applications, I measure bubbles in shoes, I measure bubbles in carpets, I measure bubbles all around the place. I measure the interaction between bubbles and sound, and we will hear about that in a few seconds. But I also do, every now and then, measure soap bubbles. And it happened, in fact, that uh, in March I was called to actually judge the largest bubble, what is currently the largest bubble in the world, the largest soap bubble in the world, which is 23.3 cubic meter in size. Now, to give you an idea, this is, well, 65,000 cans of Fitzy drink, like this, or also uh, larger than my own uh, sitting room, I must say. Now, this was done in London. The previous record was uh, 20.6. Uh, it's a very hot record, the one of making the largest bubble in the world. The trick was putting an uncertainty, and that is, so this is the first bubble which has an uncertainty now, and that is, as a metrologist, a great success. Because uh, the difference between an object and another one, and how precise and how accurate is your measurement, sits in how confident you can be in your number. But we were also talking about a shape that you need to make bubbles, and you might know that if you use different shapes, you can make different sizes of bubbles. Now, let me try that. As I said, that's an experiment. Let's see if it works. So I'm using a, a, some metal wire in the shape of a cube, and I'm putting it in, and I'm taking it out, and hopefully, if everything gets well, so not the first time, but the second, maybe. What you get is a cubic bubble. Now, you can imagine that if you use a shape like that, you'll get something different, which is, you might guess, a triangular bubble. And so on and so on, because you can continue with this and get a prism-shaped bubble. Now, however, when you blow them out, well, and they survive, they come back spherical. And we spoke about surface tension. The, the actual point is that a bubble is spherical because that's the shape which saves energy. So whenever you blow a soap bubble, that's a, les a lesson that nature is giving us. Because the shape a bubble takes is the one which consumes less energy to make. And that's the same in here. The trick is the energy is given by, in a way, the shape. So this means that if you have a particular shape, then you can have very incredible sort of shapes or bubbles. And this is what some small animals in the sea do. They, they are part of what we call plankton. They have been around for 600 million years. And what they do is they have skeletons, which look like the ones that I have used here. And they, on them, on, on those skeletons, what we could call the skin sits down. So they are living bubbles in mathematical terms. When, when I first heard of that, I understood why nature is always so much to be observed and wow, 
so much astonishing for us because this has been going for so many years while mathematics only could cope with the equations which describe the cubic bubble and the angles which form in 2003. But we can do better because the same physics describe a Victorian age dress. Because in a Victorian age dress, you have a uh, some sort of um, um, a shape which keeps the fabric on top, and that sits. And to make sure that the weight does not weigh too much on the lady, then you need a special shape which minimizes the energy. And again, this applies to what uh, in 2006 were very famous. Uh, and so bubble hem. Um, New York Fashion Week 2006, all the stars at the time appeared wearing bubble hems and they are made by a harder fabric this time and the fa soft fabric sitting on top to give them the shape of a bubble. And of course you can push that forward until you reach Lady Gaga who was wearing bubbles in a concert in 2009. And that was for bubble in which we put a person. But then, can we get bigger? Well, you can start by putting a person in a bubble like that. Now, uh, this lady here is trying to eat an apple. And as you might see, she's having some problems with that. And so maybe living in a bubble does not seem to be so simple as you would expect. But after a bit of effort, you manage. And, and you can push that further. In 2007, people put an elephant in a bubble. That was live on BBC. And you can push that further again. And in the Guinness World Record, the current record for how many people you can put in a bubble is 200 and 14. Why would we want to study how many people we can put in a bubble? Well, but this, in this case, because they want to launch a chocolate with bubbles. But there is another bit. Now, if you go back to science fiction movies, and well, this is from Star Wars the first, uh, you see that cities on other planets are always in the shape of bubbles. And that's because, as we heard, that's the shape which keeps less energy. But that's not just in science fiction movies, that's the Eden Project in Cornwall. Or that's what NASA is preparing for us if one day we will go and live on Mars. So if one day we reach other planets, we will probably be living in bubbles. And that's not new again, because if you think about uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, that's something, a structure, which keeps something harder on top and she keeps air inside and the rest of the world outside. And the physics and the mathematics which distribute the weight are again the same. So maybe architecture has discovered, the, uh, at least practically, how to use bubbles to make something bigger earlier. But I said at the start, I want to convince you that bubbles are in our life. And so, to do that, I went to the supermarket. And the first thing I found is this. Which is, if you can see it from the back, is Swiss cheese. Now, if you and I decide after tonight that we want to start making Swiss cheese and selling it in the US, well, there is a specific law which tells you how many holes you can have and what is their size distribution. So you just want to be them exactly right. And this leads me to chocolate. Now, at the moment, there are three chocolate, well, no, there is one missing there, but there are three common chocolates in the UK uh, which contain bubbles. Now, let's, let's, let's see, how can, how can that work? If you have bubbles which are too big, there is no chocolate left, and that's not something you would like. But if you have bubbles which are too small, then it's the same old chocolate. So you cannot sell them as a different product. And so what they did is uh, they uh, conducted a study, actually in Australia the first time, um, and this led to the production of air. And they, what they did is they 
uh, got a panel of experts and they had to taste chocolates with different sizes of bubbles until they found the one which was perceived to be the best. This study has been replicated at the University of Reading two years ago, if I'm not wrong. So there is people who are actually trying to measure how many bubbles you can put to make food better. And well, if you think about those that you might or might not eat at breakfast, and again, you want the right bubbles there because you want them to pop, or you don't want them to pop, you want them to be crisp, or you don't want to be crisp. And again, it all goes to the bubbles. But I've spoken enough, what I would like to do tonight is an experiment. So let's do, let's try to replicate what these guys did with chocolate. So what I would like to have is five volunteers. Can I have five of you here on this line? Come on. The worst that can happen is that you're having chocolate. <laughs> Thank you, I need a fifth. Okay, so what we will be doing is this experiment. I give you, I'll ask you to close your eyes and to put in front of you your hands. So I'll put a type of chocolate in your right hand and I'll ask you to taste it with your eyes closed. And then we will do the same with the second type of chocolate. Okay? Before we start this experiment, of course, health and safety first. Do you have problems with chocolate? No? Can you survive two pieces of chocolate? Yeah? yeah? Great. So, they will, we will not tell them what chocolate they are tasting, but we will know. Right? Okay, so, close your eyes. And we will start. Are your eyes closed? Great. We will start with this chocolate here, which... Okay, so, can you put your right hand in front of you? And that's first piece second piece, third piece, fourth piece, and fifth piece, and taste. And now we go with the second hand, so put your left hand in front of you, and that's one, two, three, four, and five, and taste. Now, what I would like you to do is to raise your right hand if you prefer the first chocolate and your left hand if you prefer the second. Now, we have one, so you can open your eyes. We have one, two, three for the first and two for the second. Now, the first one was without bubbles and the second one was with bubbles. So apparently, maybe they haven't done a good job. <laughs> now, can I have a round of applause for you? And if you see it, we'll discuss what we just have done. So what we have done is we used the example of bubbles to measure perception, which is an incredible task, but still is something that is done uh, behind our back, maybe, every day. It's done by changing the lights that we see on uh, meat at supermarkets. It's made by changing the music that we hear at supermarkets. Is done by changing the music that we feel or we listen to when we go in airports. So there are a lot of studies which are trying to influence or to actually not to influence because that's wrong, that's too much big brother. No, which are trying to predict how a product will be received before that goes on the market. Now, but this was a scientific experiment. Now, when I do a scientific experiment, I go back home and I write a paper and then I submit it to a journal, and then my peers kill it. Oh, sorry, comment on it constructively so that I can make a better paper. So what I would like you to do tonight with me is to uh, comment on the experiment that we have just done. I did on purpose two errors. Let's see if we can spot them. So, ideas. That gentleman there was at the back. I don't know. Uh, must be Any idea? It's order. It's order. There might be an effect of order. So, 
There might be the fact that your uh, taste was saturated by the first chocolate. True. That's a minor effect, though. Any other thing? The sample size might be different. And on purpose, in fact, I gave two different sample sizes. And you have to thank Lizzie for that, because she sized them before. Any other idea? But still, that's not the major thing that I did. I cannot hear you. There was no control group. That's a very good point. But also, I had only five people. And you cannot do statistics with just five people. We call of the, we speak of the law of great numbers. Well, five is still not enough to be great. Or large numbers is probably the right way to say that. Any other thing that you can spot? It's a very like, subjective test because some people might just prefer more bubbles, some people might just prefer less. There is another thing. I didn't ask whether you prefer dark chocolate or milk chocolate, because you might be biased towards milk chocolate. So I asked whether you had problems with chocolate, but again, that's subjective. So to cut the long story short, when you do an experiment, what you try to do is you try to uh, put in different pigeon holes the different parameters that control the effect. And you try to control them, to isolate the last one, which was what's the best size of bubbles. Sometimes you do it, sometimes you don't. And that's why I think uh, it's great to be part of a community of scientists, jokes aside. Because in that, in that case, uh, you can always compare your findings with someone else. I don't think science is anymore something that can be done in an ivory tower. And that's also why I'm here tonight, because I think that talking with people about what we do is a crucial part of being a scientist. But let's go back to taste. Now there is a French study which dates 2007, again if I'm not wrong, which claims that 30% of the taste of champagne depends on bubbles. And this is a French study so they should know their champagne, shouldn't they? Now this is not new though. There is a patent, a British patent, at the end of the 18th century, which says that this guy uh, patented a way to treat glasses in a different way so that they could produce more or less bubbles when you pour the champagne in. So, this has three things for us. One is, if you drink champagne in a flute or in a glass for wine, and you feel that the taste is different, there might be something true into that. And it is because the bubbles are different. When you taste wine, and you might have seen sommelier doing that, what they do is they create bridges. And depending on the size and the shape of the bridges, they measure surface tension. And in that way, they measure visually what's the content of good stuff in the wine, let me call it that way, compared to bad stuff. And what they do is they are measuring bubbles. And again, if you then could change in some way the size of the bubbles, then you could change the taste. And this is done with fizzy drinks. So if you go and buy a, a, a fizzy drink at McDonald's in a, in a country or another one, then you feel that they taste different, again, there might be something true into that. Because at the size of the bubbles, is targeted to change slightly the experience of the customer that goes there. Japanese like the uh, like larger bubbles than we do in this country. But this goes to my favorite, which is ice cream. You might have spotted that um, my accent sounds a bit like the one of Elisabetta who introduced me. And that's because uh, I studied in Italy and I was born there and everyone knows, everyone knows that Italian ice cream is the best. But the point is that if that's true also for you, what you want is that you like your bubbles smaller. Because the way ice cream is made in Italy makes bubbles smaller than the one we do in this country. And also, it, oh, but, but, but why bubbles? Bubbles in ice cream? What's that? Now, 
if you examine ice cream, 50% in volume is actually bubbles. And the percentage of volume of bubbles goes from 50% to 70%. So when you buy ice cream, you're actually buying bubbles with a flavor. Now, in fact, if you want the, the ice cream to go smoothly and you pour it just like you do in our parks, then what you do is you add more air to this. You add more bubbles. And when I was researching on this statement, I found a strange news on the internet which says that, um, so is it, is, um, as a newspaper, who claims that one of the first jobs of Margaret Thatcher was actually putting bubbles into ice cream. And so I did a bit of research and there is something true into that. So if nowadays we can have ice cream in our parks, we have to thank the Iron Lady because she was the first, or one of the first, to patent the way to do that. So why bother about bubbles? Because they are everywhere. In our food, in our stuff, in what we build, in what we will build. But also, they are behind two of the biggest mysteries of our times, which is, why do bubbles in Guinness go down instead of going up? This has been just so there's been a paper which won the Ig Nobel Prize, not the Nobel Prize, the Ig Nobel Prize, and it was done, a study made by Trinity College Dublin. You would expect that, wouldn't you? And they, and they discovered why this happens, and it's only because, and it's because Guinness is a special beer, and that makes Guinness a special beer. But there is another issue, which is this. Now, you might know that there was a competition, well, a debate in court about whether Jaffa cakes are cakes or biscuits. Now, let's go to our everyday experience. If you have a biscuit and you leave it on the table, what will happen? Will it become stale? Fair enough. But it will become soft or hard? Soft. What will happen to a cake instead? It will become hard. And so, this, well, that's a bubble lecture, right? So you will not be surprised if I tell you that the cause behind this is the bubbles. And the interesting bit is that when you crunch them, you can listen to a different sound. And so when you crunch a biscuit, like some of my colleagues this, uh, you can actually find the right sound. And this goes back to crisps. You want crisps to do the right sound. And you want packages in the right sound and it all comes to sizing your bubbles the right way but that's not all of it because we said about controlling bubbles so let me show you what you can do if you can control your bubbles right to do this I love to to do an experiment so can I have your help please Come and shake this to the, your worst possible. Yeah, like that. Okay? Elizabeth, please come. So, what we'll do is we will open this can in the face of Elizabeth, of course. But first, we we'll provide her with some health and safety equipment which I hope will fit you. <laughs> Wonderful. Am I smart? Oh, you are really smart. <laughs> so are you happy about shaking this? Yes. So can I open that now? <laughs> no, I can't, okay. Right, so can I open that here? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Right, thank you for your help. I'll keep shaking if you don't mind, just to make sure that Elisabetta is not saved. So when I was a younger, I used to go hiking on mountains and I had one of those in my backpack and then I reached hike, 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 and then reached the top of the mountain and then I opened it and, <laughs> and then I started studying science and the science of bubbles and I discovered that with an incredible success of technology also known as a spoon you should have one of those in your houses you can control the bubbles now 
as I said, this is an experiment, and that's why we had some health and safety. She looks worried, does she? Now, if you do this at home, remember that bubbles are only formed at the wall, and this includes the bottom and the top. Shall we go? Not bad, I would say. So what did I do, do you think? You just detached the bubbles from the wall. Yeah. And then the bubbles were inside and they disappeared. How did I do that? By the sound. By vibration. Yeah. And vibration is a type of sound. So thanks to Elisabetta for putting her face <laughs> on this. Uh, now to make you this one? yes you can keep that i'm sure and to make sure that that was not a trick yeah right i could do worse of course but we're not the first who use bubbles or controlled bubbles to get something nice. This is a movie, so the, the voice will, will be the one of Sir David Attenborough. And what you see there is a dolphin. And this dolphin is actually hunting using bubbles. What it does is that he goes round and round in circles, all day long I would say, and what he does is that in this way he creates bubbles. And those bubbles are scaring the fishes which are inside there. And those fishes jump out of the net and there are his friends waiting for lunch. These are called bubble nets. And it's incredible how again nature is always much, much to learn from. What is happening there is that the bubbles which are formed make sound. They vibrate and in this way they create a loud bang inside there and this scares the fish who wants to go out. But we control bubbles every day in our houses. So do you have one, one piece of that? That's a washing machine. Now if you get dirty clothes and put them into soapy water and wait Will they be cleaned? No, you have to move them. And by moving, you create bubbles, because it's the bubbles which do the cleaning. No bubbles, no cleaning. And what the bubbles do is they go inside the fabric and take the dirt, the dirt out. You need the soap to release a bit, to soften the, this, the attachment of dirt to the fabric, but no bubbles, no cleaning. And in fact, nowadays you can buy washing machines where they add bubbles, to make them work better, they say. Working better means that uh, you can do the same washing with a lower temperature. In terms of savings, this accounts to about 200 pounds per year, which might be interesting if you are doing a lot of washing. But the question is, how do you define whether a fabric or a cloth is cleaner than another one? That's a dispute that I will not enter in. It's tricky, that's again, something very difficult to measure. But let's go to this other one. You may have heard of baby colics. Now, until a few years ago, a baby colics affected one baby every three. Is it? Yes. Now, this means, no, one, one baby every four, that's the, the right number. So they studied it, and they found the correlation between colics and the formation of gas in the stomach of the baby. And, and they found that this is created when the baby sucks the milk. Because uh, the tongue of a baby, so a baby needs to learn how to get milk, because it's not easy. What it, what the, the, the phenomenon works with the tongue going back and creating a suction just like a pump. And in that way, this sucks the milk in. But if you are not skilled enough, or if the, the, 
the surface is too hard, this creates also, this gets air into. And so the bubbles which are formed in that way go inside, coalesce, get big, and create pain. So they solved this by shaping uh, the bottles in a way that they create less bubbles. And they pass the statistics to one baby every five, from one to four to one to five. Now, if you are the parents of that baby, that makes a lot of difference. And what they did is they just controlled the bubbles. But that's the same that they did. Uh, that's the same problem that astronauts had the first time they went on the space station, because in that case they had they were given samples of this thing here, being Americans, and they drank it. And since there is no gravity there, the bubbles stopped in their stomachs, and they were extremely painful. And if you are an astronaut, that's not cool. So they solved the problem by creating a, um, well, a fizzy drink that you can only drink on the space station. So we were saying before that there are, you can taste different uh, tastes by changing the size of bubbles, but there is one that you need to be an astronaut to test. So why bother? Because again, controlling bubbles is key to a lot of things, to a lot of technologies that actually we have in our houses. So my role as a scientist is to understand all of this and to make that better. And I choose a particular arena to do that, and that is the sound of bubbles. Now, to go, we have seen already that sound can do something to bubbles. But let's go and make an experiment together, all together this time. So close your eyes and imagine. You are on the seaside. It's a beautiful, beautiful summer day. You can feel the sun on your skin. You can feel there is a gentle breeze, so it's not too warm. What's the sound you're hearing? Can you make that for me? I'll give you a hand. Are you hearing that? Now, can you make that for me? Come on, you will not be recorded. A bit stronger. A bit stronger. Also, you there at my back. 90% of that sound comes from bubbles. It's not the pebbles. It's not the movement. It's bubbles. These bubbles are formed when the wave arrives. And, they, and then they do this. They get smaller and larger, smaller and larger, smaller and larger. They do aerobics. And in doing that, they create sound. Just like when we do aerobics, some way. And, and, and this is the sound we hear. There is nothing as the sound of water. Every time you hear sound in your shower, when you boil water at the seaside, it's always the sound of bubbles. This means that if you design a big fountain, like the one that we have at Hampton Court, this creates different bubbles than the one that uh, are created by a small fountain, like the one that is in front of Westminster at St. Thomas and Guy, on the other side of, of, the, of the river. Now, so you design fountains and you are designing your bubbles. But can you imagine that? Only 10%. And also, we are not hearing all of it. We only hear only a part of the sound that is produced. And this is in, an incredible discovery because in this way, you can measure how much air is ex exchanged between the water and the atmosphere. And that's one of the parameters that you put into global warming models. So there, is, there are some of my colleagues who spend their time uh, work, working along Caribbean beaches and listening to the sound of bubbles. That's an odd job, isn't it? Someone has to do that, yes. That's very, very true. Now, but also, 
you, you can use this to measure all sorts of things because then if you if you have bubbles that you know then the sound will depend on what's happening around them in fact the sound of the sea during a tempest is different from the sound of the sea when everything is calm and there is the wind into that I'll, I'll agree on that but there is also a different size of bubbles and these are the easiest experience you can do with bubbles but there are other experiences that you can do and we, we talk about washing machines but also glasses are cleaned by bubbles and also Formula 1 engines are cleaned by bubbles and surgical instruments in our hospitals are cleaned by bubbles and there is a study which says that allegedly at the dentist if you feel pain is because the bubbles that are created by the drill are too big so again measuring the bubbles and how they form and what they do affect our lives and this is and this takes me to explaining you a bit of the physics now but before i do that let me do a demonstration so what i have here what do you think i have here Marshmallows. Marshmallows. Great. So what we have here is a pump, or those that you normally use to preserve wine. So I asked you because you look very fit. So you give me a hand by extracting the air, and can you please describe the others? What's happening to the marshmallows? Okay. So I'll hold the bottle, and you pump. Another bit. That's enough, I think. So, marshmallows got bigger. To prove you that, let's get the pressure back. They got smaller. They got smaller. So, first of all, thanks. I wouldn't have managed that without <laughs> help. So, can I have a round of applause for my home helper? The, this tells us three things. One is, we changed pressure and we changed the size of the bubbles in the marshmallows. This is what happens to the bubbles which are formed by the waves. This phenomenon in a liquid is called cavitation. The formation or the dynamics of bubbles under a local change of pressure. But there are two things that we have to learn. If you buy marshmallows on the top of a mountain, the pressure will be lower. So they will look bigger. But when you go back, eat them there, because when they, you go back, they will be smaller. So if you like your marshmallows big, eat them on the top of a mountain. And as to, to repeat that, think about sound like a local, like a controlled change of pressure. It's, take, it's like taking a balloon on the top of a mountain and then suddenly at the bottom of the sea, they change their size. And if you repeat that quickly, then you can control the size of the bubbles. And so we said that this phenomenon is called cavitation in a general sense. And let me see that in action. So this is an ultrasonic part. There are many, there is one in every chemical laboratory all around the place, but there is also one of these in each of our hospitals. And what they do is that if, so they measure whether this one is working by putting an aluminum foil inside and waiting. And if you can see the movies well, now that it's a bit darker, you'll see that holes are appearing on the aluminium foil. And if you could touch that one, you would feel them like small explosion. Each of those holes is created by bubbles, which are eroding the aluminium. Eroding, destroying, what's that? I mean, so far we, we talked about bubbles that we wanted or we wanted to control, but in this case, these are bubbles that maybe we don't want. And in fact, that's what destroys propellers of ships. Cavitation was first studied by Lord Ryling because the Royal Navy went to him and said, the propellers of our ships have been destroyed. So we don't want that. And so people have started to study ways to avoid that and to, ch to control the change of pressure over the propellers. And that's an interesting fluid dynamics problem in itself. Not trivial. But this, the same phenomenon we use to destroy kidney stones. 
So if you know everyone who has been treated for kidney stones, they have been bombarded by sound. And we learned that sound creates bubbles, and bubbles, if there are a lot of them or they are not controlled properly, they erode. And that's what happens to the kidney stones. They are eroded like this until they are so small that the kidney can get rid of them. Now, this also key, this was the fact that there is bubbles and sound was what's also one of the key discoveries to detect submarines. But I will not tell about that unless you ask me about this later. What I want to tell you is that what we do is we listen to the sound of bubbles to measure them. And the change is passing from a single beat to a concerto, like the one of the sea, where a lot of notes are present. And the more of that you hear, the more bubbles there are. And in this way, you can also do a bubble organ. Now, there is no sound tonight, but if you, if you imagine three big, well, four big uh, columns of water with different sizes of bubbles, each of them making a different frequency of sound. Small bubbles, high pitch. Large bubbles, low pitch, just like bells. You can actually play my little, other little lamp with one of those. And we have seen this, but let's see how nature uses this. And again, that would have been the voice uh, of Sir David Attenborough. That's from BBC. And what you see there is the story of a small shrimp called the piston shrimp. It has a large claw and a small claw. And the large claw, he prepares it and snaps. And this creates a cloud of bubbles. And this cloud of bubbles, eventually, inside them, there is a temperature which is very, very high. Now, if you Google this on the movie, it will say as high as the surface of the sun. That's not exactly true. It has been measured that the temperature inside those bubbles is about 200. 250 degrees. Still, it's quite hot. And also, there is a bang of sound, as we have learned. So if you're a fish, and I am the shrimp, and I snap, this creates a stunning sound, and the fish is stunned. So this, this shrimp snaps, and lunch is served. Would you not sign for that? I would. But more importantly, this fish, because there is an higher temperature, doesn't like sushi. Because maybe every now and then he also cooks or eats. And that's fascinating because actually, if you reproduce this in the lab, you can go as high as the temperature inside the sun. Well, not completely to the core, but just a bit inside. So, how hot is one of those, do you think? Okay, let's start from easy. How hot is boiling water? 100 degrees. 100 degrees, I from my back. How hot is the iron in the board? About like the shrimp, 200, 240 usually. A lamp normally goes, so fire goes to a volcano, goes to 1,500. Lights that we have in our house can go as high as 2,000, 2,300. And to know about color and light and how hot a star can be, you should listen to one of the previous talks given by my colleague, Andrew. But what I want you to tell is that in a small bubble, you can go as high, so the surface of the sun goes to 6,000 degrees. Inside the bubble, you can go as high as 20,000 degrees. And so people started to think, can we use this to make fusion? And Hollywood arrived before science, and there is a movie, uh, 1996, uh, called The Chain Reaction, where um, they use this phenomenon, which is called sonoluminescence, so sound which creates light. And light, when there is light, there is hot to create energy. Now, um, I haven't seen the movie myself, so I cannot recommend it. Uh, but there has been people, including myself, who have been trying to study this phenomenon. And we also said that bubbles have a sound, and this depends on the size. And this is what we use in our hospitals nowadays already 
to ant for cancer. Now, a patient with suspect of having cancer in the liver gets an ultrasound scan. Ultrasound is something that is used for almost everything nowadays in our hospitals because it's cheap, it's easy, it's not too tricky, it's also safe. At least in the way we use it so far. This gives, but if you have ever seen a, the image of a baby, an ultrasound image of a baby, you know that it's very blurry. It's very difficult to get that diagnosis by an ultrasound image. In fact, a doctor has 60% chance of giving the right diagnosis. And so what the practice uh, suggests is that the doctor, if he thinks, he or she thinks that the patient has cancer, puts him or her into a waiting list for a different type of exam, which can be MRI, which can be PAT, eventually it can be a biopsy. There is a waiting time between the first day and that day. And then after the second exam, the diagnosis is correct up to 85%. So if it's a positive, a treatment starts. And the doctors, if it's not so sure, the doctor says, come back in a few months and we do another check. It has been demonstrated that if you use bubbles injected in the blood, and be careful on that, everyone, when, whenever, when we say bubbles in the blood, we say, ah, that's bad. These bubbles are coated with fat, like ice cream. So they don't get together. They don't coalesce, they don't get big, they don't block everything. And in that way, you can, but they sound just like the best, as we were saying before and they stay in the blood. And when you have, and when the patient has a, has a cancer, this changes the, the circulation of blood. So the veins change, everything changes because uh, these cells are greedy for blood. And so you actually, if you can detect the blood and the blood only, you can just see as a bright spot on your image, a bad guy. And the efficiency of these techniques goes to 90%, the first day, when there is a lot of blood, so in the liver. So people is trying, so researchers all over the world are looking at ways to extend this to other organs, and also to other types of diseases, like arteriosclerosis. And the way they do it is they design, they engineer bubbles that will react in a particular way to the presence of cancer by sounding differently. So my role in this is to provide these people, these incredible people, with tools to characterize their bubbles, to make sure that the bubbles they do will do the job once used at the last minute. So once used in a patient. But there is, there is much more than that. There is what we call the dream. And the dream is explained by this movie, which comes from, again, from one of the first research projects. And what you see there are the bubbles in the blood, which are doing the aerobics, and so they are creating sound. And suddenly, the music is changed, and they are broken. Now imagine that each of those bubbles carries a bit of a drug. Then you can use the bubbles first to find, and then you change from classical music to rock music, and they break. And they release the drug just where you want it. Why could this work? Well, because in this way you have to put much less drug, and if you're doing chemotherapy, that's a good point. But also because bubbles and sound are one of the few things that can work in the brain. Sound has been, so it's from last year, the use of sound to, create, to cure tremor by operating directly in the brain. So if you use bubbles, they behave a bit like in, uh, in the Asimov movie, if you have seen it, like small micro robots, like small submarines that you can control from the outside using your sound. And to do that, you want to know exactly what they do. So you want to be able to have, I call it, 
the, the Hamlet experiment. So you want to hold your bubbles like that and interrogate it before you use it. Just, your, just like Yorick's skull. And that's what I do. I manipulate bubbles. I design ways to control bubbles. So what you see there on top is a small glass uh, channel which is the size of one of the veins that we have in the end. And what, and what you see, the black dots are all bubbles. What I do at a certain point is I switch on a controlled acoustic field and they get together just where I want them. And then, but that's a, a rough control. To be able to isolate one, we want to pick one from the cloud. And what we do is we use light. Now, you might have heard of optical tweezers. So optical tweezers it has been an incredible discovery, which allows to manipulate cells or bacteria by using light. Unfortunately, bubbles don't work so well with this technique. So what we had to do was to shape the light in the form of a lasso. And we have a lasso of light that we use to take the bubble that we want to examine out of the cloud. And then we throw all the others away and we interrogate that particular one. So that's what I'm doing. I'm studying bubbles. And I'm giving people tools to check that the bubbles that they have engineered are doing exactly what they wanted to do. But I'm also studying, possibly, in collaboration with many others, ways to uh, engineer different bubbles. And the UK is, in the, in the fourth, is on the forefront of these technologies. We are one of the uh, greatest countries in the world in terms of bubble science. And London, in particular, is an incredible place to study bubbles. So, this goes to the end of my talk. I tried to convince you that bubbles are everywhere. I tried to, to tell you that bubbles affect our lives in ways that, that I hope you didn't expect before. I didn't when I started this. And there is a particular relationship between bubbles and sound, and we can exploit that. We can exploit that to clean, we can exploit that to destroy kidney stones. We can exploit that, exploit that to detect submarines. We can exploit that to cure and detect cancer in a better way. But we can also exploit that, possibly, to avoid uh, biodiesel to clog our engines. But that's another story that will be told another time. What I want to leave you with is this. I said that here, bubbles affect our lives in ways, in incredible ways. I told you earlier that one day if we will live in space, we will find bubbles. We will live in bubbles, but we will also find bubbles. Because stars are just bubbles. They are gas inside, almost nothing outside, and an interface which keeps everything together. But also, what you see there are images of space bubbles, which appear where stars are born. So there are bubbles up there, which are waiting for us. And how will we reach them? But with bubbles, of course. And so what I'll do now is I'll try my last experiment for now, and we can continue afterwards if you like. And what I'll do is I'll use a bit of this lemon juice that I add here to load my rocket with fuel. And then I'll put my secret ingredient, which is alka seltzer. And then I'll close my rocket. And nine, eight, seven, six, five. <laughs> so, starts at, bubbles are here, bubbles are there. And this is exactly how they will take us there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much.
Fabian, okay, it was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. I enjoyed it personally, thoroughly. So, we have a question for Gianluca. Who wants to kick off the question session? I have one question. Um, yes, Johnny. With the, the solar drugs that we talked about, um, when you did your research, when you, can, when you had the bubbles that were spread out and just by a certain sound frequency, they came together. How, how, like, what is it about the bubbles that makes them attract to a certain frequency? The the frequency. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me let, let me let me come into that. So, the frequency is chosen in a way that the bubbles will go in that specific place. My specific testing equipment is designed so that it reacts to a specific frequency. And what you have to imagine is this: this frequency creates in my well, that object is about that small. Uh, creates like creates what technically is called a standing wave. You have to imagine like a series of hills. Now you put the bubbles on top. If you have balls and a series of hills, where, do, where will they go? They will go bottom. Now, uh, this is a simple way to describe it. But uh, bubbles react to sound, so everything, well, if you have a drum, that will move, right? If you have a loudspeaker, a very strong loudspeaker, it will be propelled backwards if you're not careful and you put something rubbery at the bottom. So sound in itself creates a, a, a force. But bubbles also, as we learned, react to sound in a different way. They start oscillating. And this uh, brings them in specific places and aggregates them in specific places. So, the technical answer to your question is, bubbles are resonant objects, just like a specific musical instrument is. They like a specific frequency depending on their size. If you pick the frequency right, they will do your bidding. If you design the field right, they will also go where you want them to go. Did I answer your question? I can be more technical a bit later if you want. Yeah. Any other question for the Any sort of curiosity you have? No, not the moment. Okay. Well, I have a question personally. Here we go. <laughs> well, two questions, if I may. Two? Wow. Yes, I want. You are, you are generous with me. Come on, come on. <laughs> Now the first question is on the chocolate. I've always been intrigued by uh, how do they make the bubbles inside the chocolate? I mean, is there any particular sort of procedure to be followed? Uh, how can they make them so precisely? When you open, open up uh, one of these you know, chocolate bars with the mm -hmm. bubbles inside, they're quite regular, I would say. They're not irregular at all. Otherwise, you, would not have, you could not guarantee that they have always the same Effectivity, yeah. Yeah, so how can they control so precisely the bubbles inside the chocolate? I mean, is, what is the procedure? I think controlling the size of bubbles depends, as we heard from the start, from what you use to make them. Mm. That is the easy bit. Mm. It's making them stay in chocolate, which is the difficult bit. Now, chocolate is a very interesting... Um, okay, first of all, I have to say that the right answer to this question is, I don't know. Uh, the, however, I have an opinion, which is the following. Opinion also means I'm guessing. So what I think is happening is that chocolate, uh, when you make it, you need to be very precise on your temperature. There is a moment when chocolate can go all wrong if you don't control your temperature right, and that's the temperature where it solidifies. So, if you design your bubbles, you know, if you choose the size that then when you change the temperature and make it solidify, so when you decrease the temperature, they will stay the size you want, then you can keep them in place. So one way, basically, is to blow bubbles through uh, a, a series of holes and then change the temperature at the right time so that they can stay there. That's method one. 
Method two, chocolate is very viscous. If the size of the bubbles is very small, they will take a lot of time before they go away. And the, while the size is precise, they are not uniformly distributed. So there might be something of that, which probably is cheaper than controlling the temperature very correctly. Um, so my guesses are, they create, there is of course a third way, which is you could use sound. And you would, in this way, you would be creating uh, bubbles which are just the right size because you picked the right frequency. And in that way, the problem then becomes, how do I keep them there? So, in answer, so to summarize, making the bubbles in the right way is not too tricky if you have a way to measure them outside. <laughs> because you can make bubbles, we all can make bubbles, but can you make the bubbles always the same? That's the tricky bit. And how do you know that they are always the same? And that's what we do. We try to guarantee to, to produce tools in the industry that will give them a way to measure the bubbles in the same way. Uh, in a traceable way is the right way. That's one bit. The second bit is how they keep them there. Well, as I said, it's probably a combination mm -hmm. of temperature and viscosity. And to give you an example of that, so can we take a vote? Cheddar. Let's take a vote on cheddar. Shall we do that? Uh, we are in election time. We are, I'm not asking you to vote on anything else. So, do you prefer, so if you prefer mild cheddar, raise your hand now. That's me. If you prefer mature cheddar, raise your hand now. Well, it turns out that if you prefer mature cheddar, you like your bubbles smaller. Now, if you go home and slice your cheddar very, very thin and put it against the light, you'll see the bubbles. And if you try that with mild cheddar and mature cheddar, you'll see only the small ones in mature cheddar. What happens is that with time, the larger ones go away. Yeah? While the smaller ones live longer. Also, but I think it's just a matter of gravity mainly. In fact, in a, in a slice of cheddar, if you pick, pick a large one, they are not again equally distributed. And so that's where my guess from chocolate comes from, yeah. or my observation on cheddar. <laughs> Whether the guys who make bubbles with chocolate will eventually tell me their secrets, I hope so. <laughs> Your second question. Yes. Why do the bubble, why do the bubble of the Guinness they go down rather than going up? You didn't explain that. I didn't. No. No. And I was curious. I was waiting for it. <laughs> well, I had to leave something for you to question. <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> now, oh, that's not. I'm not saying that this was prepared, but I left something around to see. Uh, well, let's go back to this. What we see in a Guinness uh, glass is only the outside, because Guinness is dark. And then there is a foam on top to be a proper Guinness glass. Now what happens is that we only see the bubbles which go down, but in the center there are bubbles which go up. So in reality what's happening is that you have a circulation of bubbles which go like this. And this comes from the fact that there is something on top and there is also uh, the way the glass is shaped. And so, basically, we are only seeing a part of the story. We are not seeing all of it. And this, as a physicist, is a great lecture. It's a great discovery, in my opinion, because we always create models of what we see, but science goes forward when these models fail. And this, is, this has given us relativity, this has given us uh, transistors, computer, mobile phones, etc., etc. The fact that maybe what we believed in up to a few years before was simply wrong.
or not wrong, but not, not all the picture. Not entirely true. Uh, we have any more questions for, uh, for Gianluca? Something you want to ask about? Uh, some curiosity? No? Okay. Well, in that case, let us thanks once again Gianluca. Thanks for your attention.